This is the easier to read version of 1984 by George Orwell, retold and narrated by Sarah Simpson. Part 2, Chapter 3. As soon as Julia woke up, she quickly dressed and got ready to leave. She had a plan for how each of them should get home in order to avoid the thought police. Winston was glad she knew what she was doing, because all of this was new to him. She said she had to hurry home so she could get to an evening meeting of the Junior Anti-Sex League. Best not to change your routine, she said. The next month, they met in another secret place in the country that Julia knew about. It was an old abandoned church far away from the road. The bell tower smelled terrible because of the pigeons who lived there, but they didn't mind. Most of the time, the only way they could be together was to meet on a busy street. They walked near one another, but not too close. They didn't look at one another. Winston wished he could hold her hand. They talked, but they had to be careful to stop every time a party member walked by or they passed a telescreen. It made it hard to have a real conversation, but Julia seemed used to it. She even had a name for it, talking by installments. Julia was an expert at having sneaky conversations. One night as they were walking, a bomb exploded near them. Winston and Julia were both thrown to the ground as pieces of concrete and other debris fell around them. When he opened his eyes, Julia's face was next to his. She was still and white. She was dead. He put his hands on her face and kissed her, not caring who saw. She opened her eyes. She wasn't dead. There was just dust on her face from the explosion. His first thought was, I'm so glad she is alive. His second thought was, I hope no one saw me kiss her. Luckily, no one saw. Even getting to meet in the evenings for a walk was challenging. Sometimes they got to the meeting place and the police were nearby, so they had to skip that night. Both of them worked long, unpredictable hours. Winston worked at least 60 hours a week and Julia worked even more. Despite the challenges, they were able to meet fairly often. He had begun to learn more about her. She worked in the fiction department, but he knew that even before they started seeing one another. She liked her work. She didn't write the books. Her job was to fix the machines in the shop. She liked working with her hands. As a girl, she had been a leader in the spies, and as soon as she turned 16, she joined the Junior Anti-Sex League. She did everything expected of a young woman in the party. Julia was such a trusted member of the party that she had been trusted to work in the Pornosec division of the fiction department, the group within the department that created pornography for the proles. She thought it was hilarious that prole teenage boys thought they were buying porn on the black market, when really it was the party who created it all. She told him that Pornosec only hired women. Women, they thought, were less likely to sneak a look at the pornography and lose control of themselves. Julia thought this idea, too, was hilarious. She was a woman, and she liked sex more than most men. Unlike Winston, Julia had never lived in a world without the party and Big Brother. She just accepted that this was the way the world worked. In Julia's mind, things were simple. She wanted to have a good time. The party wanted to stop her from having a good time. That meant she had to sneak around so she could have fun. Julia didn't care about the party's ideas or goals. Her own pleasure was much more important to her than analyzing why Big Brother came up with one rule or another. In Julia's young mind, she would never get caught. She would live forever, breaking rules and avoiding punishment. Winston was older and had more life experience. He understood that it was only a matter of time before he and Julia were caught and killed by the thought police. When they met in the abandoned church, they were able to sit together and talk more freely. What is your wife like? Julia asked once. Catherine was a follower. She didn't think about the world or why things were a certain way. She just accepted whatever the party told her. If the party said it, it must be true. They made up a word to describe people like her. Good thinkful. Basically, it means that she was a natural-born rule follower who never had any thoughts the party didn't want her to have. 
Julia listened, nodding from time to time. She said she knew people like that. He told her about how he wanted Catherine to enjoy sex, but how Catherine would just lie there, doing our duty to the party. Julia didn't look surprised. They teach all the girls that, she said, but I don't believe it. I like sex. Julia said the party discouraged sex as a way of creating pent-up frustration and anger among the men of Oceania. If the men couldn't release their anger and frustration with sex, they'd be more likely to let it out by going to war. Having children was also a way for the party to control people. People were supposed to have children, but as soon as the children could go to preschool, the party turned them against their parents. The party taught children from a very young age to watch their own parents for signs of thought crime and to report anything they saw to the police. It was very clever. Every child was basically a tiny thought police officer who could watch their parents every move. Winston's thoughts went back to his wife, Catherine. He remembered something that happened a few months after they were married. They were on a community hike with a big group, but they took a wrong turn and were separated from the others. Catherine started to panic right away. All she wanted to do was find the group. Winston enjoyed being away from people. As they hiked, they came to an old rock quarry, a place where rock was pulled out of the ground for use in building. The quarry was a huge, deep hole. When they stood at the edge of it, it was at least 20 meters straight down into a pile of sharp rocks. Winston looked over the edge, curious about what he could see. He saw some flowers growing on the side of the rock. They were unusual. It was one plant, but half the flowers were pink and half the flowers were dark red. He'd never seen anything like it. Catherine, he called, come look at these flowers. Catherine joined him at the lip of the quarry. She looked down at the flowers, but wasn't interested. For a moment, Winston thought about how easy it would be to push her off the edge. They were in the middle of nowhere. There weren't any telescreens, and even a microphone wouldn't be able to pick up any sounds that could prove he killed her. Why didn't you do it? Julia asked. If it were me, I would have pushed her off. I wish I had, Winston said, but probably not for the reason you're thinking. I didn't hate her. I regret it because pushing her off would have at least been doing something proactive to change my life. Instead, I didn't do anything, and my life just kept going in exactly the same pointless direction. Winston sighed and looked at Julia's young face. He knew she didn't understand. All Julia could see was adventure in taking risks. Winston, being older, saw the danger. Winston understood that they had already broken the law with their affair. They would be caught and killed. It was only a matter of time. We're already dead, he said. We're not dead yet, Julia said. Our bodies are alive, Winston agreed. People don't live forever. Everyone dies. It might be in six months or it might be in five years. We'll try to stay alive as long as we can, but eventually we will all die. As long as we are human, life and death are the same thing. That's stupid, she said. We're alive right now. Touch me. Feel how alive I am. Touch my hand, my breast, my leg. I'm here right now. Can't we just enjoy ourselves right now? Julia turned to face him and pressed her body against his. Enough talking about death, she said firmly. Let's make plans to meet again.